my name is Laura Kirby McIntosh and welcome to Autism in Action. Thanks again for tuning in and supporting all of the work uh, done by the fabulous people at the Disability Channel. As you can probably tell, we're out of the studio today and we're actually at Queen's Park, focusing at, as always on two key issues, autism and advocacy. But today we're going to broaden things a little bit and talk not just about autism, but also about all developmental disabilities. I'm really excited that today we're going to be joined by Windsor MPP Lisa Gretzky and we're going to be talking about the very significant challenges faced by adults living with developmental disabilities in Ontario. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. Before we get to that, I want to tell you a little bit about Lisa and her background. Uh, she's been a member of Provincial Parliament since 2014 and she represents the riding of Windsor West. She currently serves as the critic for the Ministry of Community so and Social Services and also uh, for homelessness. She's a dedicated community activist, an entrepreneur and a longtime defender and champion of public education. Her passion for education led her to become a member of the, the school, uh, sorry, her children's school advisory council. From there, she went on to be school trustee for the Greater Essex County School Board, and then later held the position of vice chair of the Greater Essex County, County District School Board. In addition, she's worked as a small business owner. She gives back to her community in a variety of different ways, contributes to the Windsor Youth Center and the Windsor Women's Shelter, volunteers with Do Good Divas, an organization that rec uh, raises money for local healthcare initiatives, as well as Icing Smiles Canada, a group that makes uh, cakes for chronically and terminally ill children. Lisa has served as Ontario NDP critic for community safety and correctional services. She also was critic for the Ministry of Education. She currently sits on the Standing Committee of the General Government and the Legislature Security Advisory Committee. And throughout all of her time as MPP, she's been a tireless advocate on two key issues, really health and education. She and her husband Tyler live in Windsor with their two children, and we're really excited uh, that we're going to have this opportunity to talk to an advocate who is actually an elected member of the legislature. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Lisa Gretzky, and we'll hear what she has to say about advocacy. Equitech Employment Equity Solutions is Canada's number one subscription-based outreach provider. Equitech's Outreach Network takes your employment posting and job information and distributes it directly to over 800 outreach partners nationally. Driving the qualified candidates you're looking for right to your door. So why not connect to the largest diversity broadcast portal and be a part of Equitech's diverse and comprehensive outreach strategy today? Check us out at www.equitech.ca. Socially Served is sponsored by Equitech Employment Equity Solutions. Hi, welcome back to Autism in Action. We're coming to you today from Queen's Park and we have the honor of interviewing MPP for Windsor West, Lisa Gretzky. Thanks so much for joining us, Lisa. It's really great to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. You've been MPP for three years now. What's your favorite thing so far about the job? I would say the favorite thing about the job is uh, that I am, as of right now, uh, because the number will be changing, one of 107 people in this entire province who has the opportunity to do this. That's huge. Yeah. So there is not a day that goes by uh, that I that I go by, past this building or enter this building without thinking, wow, this is, this is spectacular. Not everybody gets this opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and through this opportunity, uh, I get to help people who, who would feel normally they don't have a voice, don't know how to advocate on their own behalf. Um, I get to do something uh, that I love to do, uh, which is helping others. Um, so it's pretty special. Indeed. Yeah. What are the parts about the job that are frustrating for you? Oh, I would say uh, the politics, right. which sounds funny coming from a politician. Right. The politics can be incredibly frustrating. So when you have something that you, you want done, something you know is, is best for the people in your community or one person in particular, you're trying to either pass a law to help those people um, or just have that one issue addressed mm -hmm. um, and the politics gets in the way, the partisan politics gets in the way. I find that is the most frustrating because if we all came together on those issues, mm -hmm. we could make some pretty spectacular changes and help a lot of people. So you've talked about seeing yourself a bit as an advocate for some people who are vulnerable that may not be able to get their own voices heard. I want to ask you a question that I ask all of my guests. 
What does the word advocate or advocacy mean to you? I think first and foremost, before you can be an advocate for anyone else, you have to be an advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to have confidence in, in your own personal beliefs um, and you have to be willing to stand by those beliefs um, and fight for your own beliefs. And once you have that confidence and once you're able to go out and advocate for yourself, that gives you the ability to be able to look at what other people need um, and to bring their voice to the table to actually stand here in the legislature, outside, um, in the community, um, even if it's behind the scenes. Because you know people think being a politician is, is public life, and it is. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. So I think that that's all part of being an advocate, is knowing what, what you stand for and what's important to you, um, and standing by your convictions, and using that to bring the voice of those who, who don't feel like they can come forward. Um, and taking their voice to the to the legislature and trying to make a difference for them. Great, thank you. So I know one of the groups that you have championed for a while now is uh, adults with developmental disabilities. What are some of the main barriers that you find that that population is is facing? Uh, one of the main barriers is access to uh, services and supports. Right. So whether that's that's funding, whether that's supportive housing. Um, whether that's, and I'll use the building we're in today as an example, this is an older building and it's not accessible to everybody. There's a lot of barriers for people who would like to come here. When we had a rally around uh, some very special schools, um, so the provincial schools for the deaf and the demonstration schools, which are for students with severe learning disabilities, I can tell you that while we were trying to um, make this building accessible and friendly for them, uh, to get interpreters in here and have them allowed on the floor to be able to interpret during debate. Um, it was it was difficult. It is a challenge. Um, so I think that that um, as politicians, it's our job to bring those issues forward, to make these public spaces accessible. And not just to look at one group um, or, or one accessibility issue, but to expand on that and look at the diverse population that we have. And they're, and they're very... Um, distinct and special needs and try and make our public facilities more accessible to everyone. Um, I think that's one of the first barriers uh, and another I would say another barrier that uh, people are facing is um, as their children are aging and becoming adults themselves the parents also age with them um, and often yeah. the supports aren't in place for the caregivers um, and there's aren't, there aren't supports in place for those adult children either. That's true. As an autism mom, that that <laughs> that hits home. Um, what do you know in your work with your constituents and and with the the broader disability community about the way that these barriers that you're talking about, how do they impact uh, the families and and the individuals of these these vulnerable people in our population? They impact them in very large and very real ways. So one story I'll share with you is a particular constituent of mine. Um, she's a mother of a daughter who's 21 who has cerebral palsy, can do very little for herself. Um, and because of specifically the wait list for passport funding, mom had to quit her job at the casino. So she, she worked at the casino mm -hmm. as a dealer. Uh, so it's a fairly well paying job with benefits and a pension. And mom had to leave that job in order to stay home and take care of her, her child. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so. Uh, what that gives you is stress in the home. It's a financial hardship for these families. Um, but we often find, um, you know, when we talk about caregiver burnout, most people are thinking we're talking about in healthcare when you're talking about providing home care for those with, with medical needs. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about caregivers for those with developmental disabilities, they also get burnout. We need to make sure that there's supports in place for the caregivers of those with developmental disabilities. So what's your assessment of the, the current network of community and, and social services and, and the programs that are, that are currently in place? Do you think the Liberals have done enough to support adults with, dis, with developmental disabilities? No, I don't believe uh, they have. And I think that you will find that there are many community organizations that try to provide support um, to those with developmental disabilities and to their caregivers, to their families. Um, but even they will come forward and tell you that it's not enough. It's very pieced together. Families are often left to try and find services on their own. Um, there's, there's wait list after wait list, whether that's for supportive housing or for funding. Um, there's wait list for community services. So those providers out in the community that want to help, uh, they themselves have wait lists 
and, and can address the needs of, of uh, these families. And so um, I don't believe the, the government, I know the government has not done enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't believe that throwing uh, money at it, and especially you'll find that as we go into an election, there will be announcements around funding. So there always needs to be funding in the system. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be giving money to these services. But there has to be some sort of plan in place, a comprehensive plan in place, and some sort of continuity in care. So by that I mean as a child uh, turns 18, they age out of what would be the care of children and youth services and into programming um, or supposed to be getting programming and services through uh, community and social services. And right now there is a gap. As soon as they turn 18, they're cut off of service. And in fact, they have to prove that that child still has a developmental disability and they start the process all over again. So the government has not done enough to address the issue. So let me turn the issue around to you then. How can these services be improved? If you were the minister and the New Democrats were in power, what changes would you make to the system? Well, I'm happy to say that we actually have, have uh, we released a vision document uh, just last week. And in that vision document, uh, it states that if we were to form government, um, that what we would do would we would eliminate that gap um, between when someone is 17 and then becomes 18. So we would eliminate that. So there would be a continuity of care um, or continuity of funding. So there would no more be that gap where you, you your child is cut off of funding at 17, and in many cases families wait four, five, or indefinite number of years to get that funding uh, back in order to pr- provide service. So what we're saying is we would eliminate that altogether. So as they transition from 7 to 18, it would be a smooth transition. You wouldn't lose your funding, which means you wouldn't lose your services. Those families would still be able to go out um, and, and use that funding to get whatever services best suits the needs of their family. Great. Now, I hear that there's uh, some community organizers in your home riding that are uh, ready and eager to draw attention to this issue. Can you tell us a little bit about them and about the event that they have planned here at Queen's Park on May 10th? Absolutely. So um, so I, I have to tell you that the issue came to me first mm-hmm. um, from a friend of mine now. I'm, I'm proud to call her friend, mm-hmm. um, Michelle Halou, whose son Noah is 19. And so she raised the issue with me about the, uh, around the passport funding and the waitlist issue. Um, and then from there, another friend, uh, proud to call her friend now, Michelle, uh, or I mean Mary Beth Rochelleau, her son uh, is going to be turning uh, 18 in just about a year and a half. And um, so she's kind of picked up the cause because she knows that in, in, a, few, in a short time frame, mm-hmm. she's going to be facing the same issues. Mm-hmm. And so we held a town hall meeting in Windsor to, to raise the, the issue, to get attention from the media around the issue, right. and to get families of children, no matter what age, to come out um, and find out what is working and what isn't working mm-hmm. with the current system set up. And one of the questions I was asked by a parent in the audience was, well, what can we do? So we talked about doing letter writing campaigns. Um, so whether that's uh, through my office and then I forward them to the premier and the minister. Uh, we talked about doing petitions. Uh, and then I said, or you could have a rally. And within 10 minutes, uh, Mary Beth Rochelleau, who was, who was there, um, was already organizing a rally. She had already worked out what she wanted to do. So May 10th, here at Queen's Park, Uh, we are going to have a rally uh, to draw attention to the fact that there is a very large gap in in funding and services once a child uh, transitions from being 17 to 18. Um, And this is open to any anybody that wants to attend whether it's a community service provider um, just a supportive community member Mm -hmm. and it's open to anybody um, that has a developmental disability it's not just one group we want to highlight that there are so many, far too many people in this province that are falling through the cracks and are not getting the funding and the services that they need. Very true. Now, last summer, the uh, provincial ombudsman released a report called Nowhere to Turn, um, and that really highlighted some of the challenges facing uh, adults with developmental disabilities. Um, what thoughts do you have about holding the government accountable for the recommendations uh, of that report? I think it's very important to hold them accountable. So you'll hear us talking about that a lot. I'm sure that subject will come up a lot at the rally. Uh, We'll have several speakers, and I'm sure that will come up. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's important to look at what's in that report, to highlight what's in that report, and remind the government as often as we can that we're still waiting for change um, and and that we will continue to advocate 
uh, until those changes are made. And if that means 2018 when we form government, then those changes will get made. All right. Okay. The last thing I want to ask you is this. Um, if people who are watching this want to get more involved in either the rally or other activities to, uh, to raise the issue of the crisis facing adults with developmental disabilities, what are some of the, the actions that you would recommend that they, that they take? How can they get more involved? Well, there's a, there's a Facebook page, and I should mention that actually the rally is named after the report that came forward from the Ombudsman. Right. So Mary Beth decided to name it Nowhere to Turn. Okay. Uh, so you will probably see many people wearing uh, black t-shirts mm -hmm. that say Nowhere to Turn on them. Some will have pictures of their family members right. on them. Um, but there's a Facebook group set up. You can either call my office or you can email my office. You can go through my website to access all that information. So that's Lisa Gretzky, MPP. Um, you can get onto the website and check it out um, and contact my office directly. And then should anybody want to, and we've had people come forward, uh, thankfully. So I should also thank uh, OPSU, uh, the union OPSU, right. who has generously donated buses all across the province to bring people to Queen's Park. Uh, not everybody is able to drive to get here or to, can afford to take the train or to, or to fly. Um, so they've offered to pay for buses to get everybody here. We're going to have uh, Smokey Thomas, the president of OPSU, speaking. Uh, Fred Hahn, uh, the president of CUPE, is also going to speak. Uh, many people may not know that Fred Hahn himself came out of uh, community living. That's where he worked right. uh, before he became the president of CUPE. So he's going to come and talk about his perspective, having been somebody right. um, that, that helps people with developmental disabilities. Um, and they, if anybody was wanting to donate any type of resources, any type of money, right. they can come through my office. We're not collecting them directly, but we can send them the information of the person who, who is taking care of that. It's interesting, some of the advocates that are coming together on, on this, you talk about Fred Hahn and Mary Beth Rochelow was actually one of the original founding mothers of the Ontario Autism Coalition. So it's interesting to see all these communities coming together to, to hold this event. Um, well, we wish you well on, uh, on May 10th and with all of the ongoing advocacy work that you're doing and, and thank you for keeping this issue uh, alive and in the face of the government on a daily basis here at Queen's Park. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Laura. All right. Hope you enjoyed that interview. We'll be back after this commercial break uh, just with a couple of announcements about the work of the Ontario Autism Coalition and what we've got coming up next. Humility, an inability to break out. I'm sitting by the door on the second floor, losing my seven year war. It's not an illusion, so why the exclusion? We just want inclusion and no more confusion. You say you're a disability dynamo. In search of a show But you know Chris Jericho Don't play the banjo So why make it political? You say I have vertigo As you hop in your Durango I scream out loud you never seen my you never seen my ego Stats outweigh The Democrats The diplomats And the bureaucrats it's no time to discriminate, it's time to eliminate, and validate, and validate, and validate. Hi, welcome back to Autism in Action. I'm your host, Laura Kirby McIntosh. Uh, what a great interview that was with Lisa Gretzky. I look forward to, uh, to interviewing more MPPs and more advocates of, uh, of different types. And of course, I'll keep up with that commitment to regularly feature guests that are on the autism spectrum themselves. This whole show is about advocacy, uh, but I also want to take some time here right now just to tell you about the advocacy work of the Ontario Autism Coalition and what we've been doing since the last show uh, when I talked to you. So going back to early March, we had a series of briefings to get ready for the release of the OAC education policy. 
Now, let me just begin by saying there's some people that are concerned that since the OAC has opened this new battlefront on the education issue, that somehow that means that we're not advocating on the Ontario Autism Program and, and the issues that affect young children with autism. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, we're recognizing here that the school system has to be part of the advocacy work that we're doing around helping children with autism. The origins of the age six and then the age five cutoff were all based around the premise that somehow when kids with autism entered the school system, they'd magically get everything they needed. But of course, we know that's not the case. So it's not a question of us abandoning the IBI issues or the Autism Ends at Five campaign. It's a question of opening a new battlefront um, as part of our ongoing efforts to really focus on advocacy across the lifespan. So to that end, um, I met with a PC member of Provincial Parliament, Lauren Coe. He's the opposition, uh, I think, assistant critic for the Ministry of Education. A couple of days later, I met with the NDP education critic, Peggy Sattler, uh, and then ran down the hall to the other side of the legislature and met with PC MPP Gila Marto. Uh, my husband, Bruce, was briefing her on the Ontario uh, Autism Program, and we rolled in some stuff about education as well. Um, we're well up over 50 MPPs that we've briefed over the last 12 years. Um, so it's interesting to, to get that perspective as we continue to meet with, uh, with provincial politicians. On Tuesday, March 21st, I had a great meeting with Sam Hammond, who's the president of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, and a number of his senior um, officials. You may have heard on the radio recently, they're running a really interesting uh, radio campaign promoting more funding for special education and support for students with mental health issues. Uh, so it was a really good conversation, part of an ongoing dialogue that we're having with teachers unions about how to balance the rights of students with special needs and the rights of other students in the classroom and the rights of teachers and education support workers to be safe in the classroom. And that's a complicated and sometimes awkward conversation, but one that we think is really important to have. Uh, on Friday, March 24th, uh, the OAC president, Bruce McIntosh, attended a meeting of the Ontario Autism Program Implementation Committee, along with our director, Sharon Gavison, and the two of them presented a program model written by uh, the executive of the, the Ontario Autism Coalition that presents a vision of what we think the new and improved Ontario Autism Program should look like. If you want to get a copy of that presentation, get in touch with either Sharon or Bruce over Facebook. Uh, I think it's posted in our Facebook group, but I could be wrong about that. The briefings continued throughout March. On March 29th, we briefed Patrick Brown and his senior staff about our proposed education policy. And then we officially released that policy at a press conference on Tuesday, April 4th, and uh, enjoyed a, a really good day there, some good media coverage on the issue. Then two days later, I met with the Minister of Education, Mitzi Hunter, to present the policy directly to her, along with a big, thick binder full of uh, what I called for her homework. I uh, was happy to say, I, I, I could say a number of things about how that meeting went, but I will say this, um, Minister Hunter listened more than she talked, and having met a lot of politicians in my life, that was refreshing. Uh, we talked about the possibility of her holding some listening circles to go out into the community and actually meet face to face with members, uh, with students with disabilities and parents who are, ra are raising students with disabilities and to hear not just the good stories, but some of the rough stories about what's going on. Your OAC Board of Directors met on Sunday, April 9th. We should be posting the minutes from that meeting on Facebook shortly. As some of you know, I'm not sure if all of you are aware, the Ontario Autism Coalition has been granted intervener status in a human rights case that's going to go up before the tribunal in May. Uh, the name of the case is SKIRT, S-K-R-T, or actually I think it's listed on Canley as J-S versus the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board. Anyways, we'll be intervening on that. That's a case that deals with the lack of intensive ABA in classrooms. So we're having ongoing meetings with our lawyers that are preparing our statements. I'm actually going to be taking the stand at that hearing briefly. So that's a thing we're doing. Then, of course, on Wednesday, April 12th, we had a rally here at Queen's Park just to remind the government that the Autism Doesn't End at Five campaign hasn't really gone away. We know and you know that there are still kids over five that can't get access to treatment. 
we know and you know that those that are getting the $10,000 installments are having enormous barriers in terms of uh, late payments and being charged late fees for those. And of course, there's the ongoing issue of DFO equity, where people on the old DFO program are not getting as much money as those getting the $10,000 installments. All of those issues are things that we continue to advocate on. Uh, Friday, April 21st, Bruce attended another meeting of the Implementation Committee. I can tell you that the, the issues of direct funding are very much live in those meetings and that there are a substantial number of government officials from the Ministry of Education who are in the room in those meetings. And that speaks well to something we've wanted for a long time, which is interministerial collaboration between the Ministry of Children and Youth Services and Education. This past Saturday, I got, we had a really great day. We got to go to the Ontario NDP Convention. Uh, officially, of course, the OAC is nonpartisan, but this was a tribute to the advocacy work of the not just the Ontario Autism Coalition, but the autism community as a whole. And so there were lots of parents and kids, and we were brought on stage and um, and honored and celebrated. And it was really humbling. It was a nice chance to, to reflect on the work that we've done in the past and also to remember how much we still have ahead of us. Also happening today, uh, our director, Sharon Gabison, is going to be meeting with Ontario's patient ombudsman, Christine Elliott, to talk about what we call Operation Accountability, which is an effort on our part to bring to light some of the unsavory practices, shall we say, and potentially ethical violations of staff employed by the regional autism programs across the province. On Tuesday, April 25th, uh, Bruce and I will be meeting with the head of, or the chief executive officer rather, of the Ontario Association of Children's Rehabilitation Services to see where we can find common ground. Uh, on Wednesday, April 26th, OAC executive members and two of our board members will be meeting with MCYS Minister Michael Coto to talk about our ongoing concerns about the OAP during this transi transitional period, as well as our worries about what may or may not happen when the new program is announced in June. On Thursday, May 4th, we'll be meeting with the Assistant Deputy Minister from the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. And if you have any specific cases or situations that you'd like us to raise to the ADM at that meeting, please get in touch through, uh, through Facebook. On May 12th, I'm going to be making a presentation to the Ontario Public School Boards Association about the OAC education policy. And then mark the week of May 16th on your calendar. There'll be at least two days of hearings there for the skirt case about IBI in classrooms happening in Toronto that week. So we're busy. <laughs> We've been doing a lot of different things. And yes, there's been some people who've been criticizing the OAC for not doing enough, for not doing the things that they think we should be doing. All I can say is we're doing our best. And keep in mind, no one in the OAC is paid. Not the president, not me, not anybody on the executive, and none of our board of directors. All of this is volunteer work. Uh, if you haven't already, I really want to urge you to officially join the OAC membership. By joining Facebook, you gain access to our conversations online, but to officially become a member, we want you to visit our website, which is www.ontarioautismcoalition.com, and there's a link there now that says become a member. If you are able to donate anything to the work that we do, that helps us cover our expenses and pay for some of the things that we try to do. You can also follow us on Twitter at ONT Autism. I want to thank everybody here at the Disability Network again for, or the Disability Channel rather, for coming out and, uh, and doing this on location. I want to thank our sponsor, American Standard. And I also want to let you know, uh, if you haven't had a chance to visit the website of the Disability Channel, please do so. It's disabilitychannel.ca. And stay tuned for a big event that they have coming up on May 17th. I'll give you more details about that on my next show. So stay tuned for that. Remember, um, keep being awesome, do the best that you can, advocacy matters, and thanks for joining us again today. I'm Laura, we'll see you next time.